As the kids dismiss, I want to throw a date out at you guys. June 28th, 1997. June 28th, 1997. If you have had a chance to talk with me outside of this context before, if you know me well, you know that I'm a pretty big sports fan, especially baseball and basketball, but really any sport that you might want to talk about. I'm normally here for those conversations. If any of you are tennis fans and you want to chat about that afterwards, let me know. Um, I'm not a particularly big fan of the sport of boxing, and I imagine that's the case for most of us in the room. I don't meet a lot of hardcore boxing fans, but I do reckon that most of us in the room recognize at least one of the two names that suited up in the ring on June 28, 1997. On one side of the ring, you had a boxer by the name of Mike Tyson, and on the other, a gentleman named Evander Holyfield. And despite competing in a sport that isn't really mainstream to most people, this brawl between Tyson and Holyfield has remained the stuff of legends for 25 years. And why is that the case? The boxing match was a big deal, but there was something about the two characters, the two men that were participating in the fight that brought it to another level, that caused it to feel like so much more of a big deal. This morning we've got a text with a conflict between two heavyweight fighters in the New Testament and really in the Bible. I imagine that most of us have noticed a difference between this Galatians sermon series that we're in right now and say the one on Nehemiah that we did last. The book of Nehemiah was mostly stories and so we spent most of our time telling stories and drawing God's word out of that. The book of Galatians has been different. It's a letter, it's more wisdom and so there's a different approach in drawing some of those things out. And every genre in scripture is important, but I've got to be honest with you guys, I really like stories. I think it's one of the reasons why I am such a big sports fan. I really like the natural storylines that are baked into the sports world more often than not. I really like it when there is an athlete that gets cut from a team and comes back years later with another team and sees that team on the field. I like it when a pair of teammates are um, struggling to get along well, one of them goes to another team and they meet up on a basketball court. I really like those storylines that are baked in. If you remember that boxing match between Tyson and Holy field, you remember that there was certainly a unique storyline with that. Not once, but twice during that fight, Mike Tyson bit the ear of Evander Holyfield. I'm not really sure what to do with that storyline, but I can tell you for sure that it's interesting. If I see that as a headline article, I'm not going to keep scrolling. I'm going to want to learn more about that. And so I'm really excited for our text this morning. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you to open to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. This morning, even for just a fleeting moment, we get a glimpse of a story that's going on in the midst of Galatians. And so I'm really excited to get to work through that together. Galatians chapter 2, our text this morning will be verses 11 through 21. In terms of structure for this text, if you've got a worship guide with you, there's a notes section there. You can see that I really took this one section of 10 verses and broke it up into two smaller. In 11 through 14, we will get the heavyweight fight between the two characters in the story. And then 15 through 21, Paul, the author of Galatians, expounds on justification and what that looks like in Christ alone. And so all of those things this morning bring us to the main idea, and it's this, seek gospel unity, avoid hypocrisy, and trust fully in Christ alone for justification. So there's three parts to that. Seek gospel unity, avoid hypocrisy, and trust fully in Christ alone for justification. And that main idea this morning is going to be really important. The main idea is always really important, but I want to lean a little bit more heavily on it today because as we get into this story, I want to draw out some of the tension and some of the drama that I believe is absolutely building in the text. If you were an eyewitness to the story that we're going to read this morning, you would have no trouble picking up on the drama that's baked into it. And so as we take this detail by detail as it's revealed in scripture, I want that to build as a way of, of grasping onto the tension that's in the story. But I don't want to turn a blind eye to where we're headed. I don't want to run the risk of manipulating the text in such a way that we're saying something that's not really there. I think it's important on the front end that we all know the end game, the end goal, the finish line that we're headed toward. And so that main idea is going to help us with that. We all know on the front end that we are headed to a place this morning that's seeking unity, that's avoiding hypocrisy, and that's trusting fully in Jesus Christ. 
And so with all of that being said, let's take a look at the text and the story this morning. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Who are the two heavyweights that we're talking about in this text? Um, thankfully, Paul does not waste much time. We get the answer to that question in the first six words. But when Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas may be a name that some of you recognize immediately. Um, for some others, Cephas is the Aramaic name of a gentleman named Simon Peter, which is a name that I imagine most of us recognize. This is the same Simon Peter who was a disciple with Jesus. He was one of the 12. The same Simon Peter who walked on the water with Jesus, at least he did for a few minutes. The same Simon Peter who denied Christ three times, and the same Simon Peter that led thousands to Christ at the festival of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And so he is one of the characters that we are looking at this morning. And then on the other side, we already know the second character. It's the Apostle Paul himself, the writer of the book of Galatians. And so these are the two characters that we have with tension in this story. And as the tension in this section builds, we know that it's a heavyweight brawl between these two. Aside, aside from Jesus in the New Testament, can you guys think of two more important, more influential characters really anywhere in Scripture and certainly in the New Testament than Paul and Peter? I'll let that question sit for a bit because I want you to consider it. Is there anyone in Scripture aside from Christ himself that has more influence over the storyline of the Bible than these two characters? I think we'd be hard-pressed to find names, especially in the New Testament, that surpass these two. And if the heavyweight names alone in the text don't convey the seriousness of the story that we're about to get into, look at the tone that Paul uses. Look at the rest of verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. You've heard quite a bit over the last several months about the idea of tone and mood in scripture. Tone is the attitude of the author as he's writing on a topic. So tone is on the front end as the author is writing what they're writing. It's the emotion, the mood that's baked into that. As you learn to pick up on that in scripture, I think you'll be amazed at what a treasure trove of content that that brings out. That has been so helpful just personally reading through scripture and doing so well. And you see the tone that Paul uses here. It's almost impossible not to pick up on this confrontational tone that Paul opens with. I could read this section of verses in a Mickey Mouse voice this morning. That's still going to come through because it's really hard to say phrases like, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned and those not be fighting words. And so we know that we're headed into something quite serious th this morning, but what is the tension in the story? We get a glimpse of that in verse 12. God's word says, for he, talking about Peter, regularly ate with the Gentiles. And I'll pause right there in that text and, and give just some background information. So that seems like a small detail, but really it's pretty significant. And so for centuries, Jews like Peter have avoided sitting down at a table and breaking bread with people that were not a part of the Jewish community. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is the fact that Jewish people for a really long time had really specific dietary laws, really specific foods that they could eat, and really specific foods that they would stay away from. And so that made it incredibly difficult to sit down with outside people and share a meal. There are other measures put in place, and if you've read any of the Old Testament, you'll be familiar with this. There are measures that God has put in place to keep his people, the Israelite people, set apart from the rest of the world. The Israelites would do this as a way of keeping themselves set apart and standing out in that way. And then in this culture, this New Testament culture, sharing a meal with someone was much deeper than it is today. It was much deeper than just an invitation and the breaking of bread. When you would sit down with someone across the table and share a meal with them in this culture, you were essentially giving your stamp of approval on that person, certainly, and often the people group to which they belong. And so for all of those reasons, it would be really radical in the New Testament to see Jews sitting down at a table with people who were not Jewish. And yet this is exactly the picture that Paul paints. If you picture this story as it's starting to unfold in your mind, you've got Paul and you have Peter, who was a Jew, sitting around a table with mixed company of both Jews and Gentiles. The next part of the verse says, so for he, Peter, regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. 
What does that phrase mean? So we know James, that's a familiar name in the Bible. We know James in the most basic way was both a traditional strict Jew, but he was also a believer in Christ Jesus. So he was both of those things. The consensus as I studied for this sermon this week is not that Paul is suggesting, or is that Paul is not suggesting that James personally sent this group onto the scene, but rather that they are a devout group of strict Jews. They are a part, this group that is entering into the scene and now is a part of the same group of Judaizers who in Acts 13 through 15 would follow Paul along and every time Paul would go to a new city and preach the gospel, this group would come along and preach a a different kind of gospel, a false gospel, whereas Paul would champion the idea of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, these group of Judaizers would come along and they would say, yeah, absolutely, we champion Christ. But it's not just that. If you want salvation in Jesus, if you want unity with God, there are all of these rules that you need to follow. You need to be careful to avoid these foods. Circumcision is something that you need to consider. Keeping the Sabbath and other laws like that. It's not just Jesus. There's more baked into it. And so if you'll pause with me just for a moment and picture this scene in your mind. You've got these two heavyweight characters, Paul and Peter. They are sitting at a table of mixed company and now all of a sudden you have this group of Judaizers that enter onto the scene for the first time. We get the continuation of the story in the next section. However, when they came, he, meaning Peter, withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party Then the rest of the Jews joined in his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray in their hypocrisy. It's this section that we finally see the source of tension between Paul and Peter. As they are sitting at the table, when Peter sees this group of Judaizers coming at the horizon, he begins to withdraw and separate himself from the rest of the group. He begins to separate himself from the rest of what is going on. Why does he do that? Because he feared those from the circumcision party. And we don't know what the source of Peter's fear was. It could have been reputation-based. He could have feared what would have been said about him or what have been done to his reputation had he been caught in this untraditional scene of Jews and Gentiles mixed together. Or there's a chance that Peter fears for his safety. If you remember in Acts 13 through 15, if you were here when we overviewed that a few weeks ago, the the tension between Paul and this group of Judaizers rose to the point where in the town of Lystra, they had Paul taken out and stoned nearly to death. There was violence that cropped up as a result of this tension between competing gospels. And so we don't know what the reason for Peter's fear was, but we do know this for sure. Peter's freedom was threatened because of Peter's fear. And this yields two results in the text. One of them is because of Peter's fear, he himself gives way to hypocrisy. Paul uses that word hypocrisy twice in one verse, in verse 13, accuses Peter of hypocrisy. Where there was once unity in the room, a Christ-centered, gospel-centered unity, all of that has now given way to division. As Peter withdraws, his action is affirming this false gospel that this group of Judaizers has been preaching. And so he himself gives way to hypocrisy. But that's not the only result. We see another in the text. Not only does Peter fall into this trap, but in doing so, he leads others to do so as well. When everyone else in the room sees Peter, the church leader, heavyweight church leader, react this way, separating himself from the Gentiles in the room, they notice, and one by one, they begin to follow suit. So much so that even, shockingly, Barnabas was led astray, according to the text, which is amazing if you know Barnabas' story. Barnabas was alongside Paul for the first missionary journey. He was one of the ones that was championing a gospel, a true gospel, based solely in Christ. He was one that was going from place to place, right alongside Paul's side, preaching this gospel. He was along Paul's side when the two were mistaken for gods that resulted in Paul getting stoned. He was right there for all of it. Barnabas was a leader in this church in Antioch, and yet even he has been led astray. All of the gospel-centered unity in the room has been crushed as we read this section of verses. And it begs a really important question that gets pushed to the middle of the table. How, how big of a deal is this really? 
And the reality is that it's absolutely huge. There is a seismic shift, a history-changing course that could have been plotted as a result of this. Could you imagine if this church in Antioch, because of what's happening here, because of Peter's actions and the rest's actions, had been convinced that this false gospel of Christ plus other things had actually been the way to go? If Paul had been stripped of some of his credibility in that process, What if this church had been swayed to begin preaching a false gospel because of Peter's actions here? What if this church, who had sent Paul and Barnabas, true gospel missionaries, out to share the gospel, had instead begun to send false missionaries out, groups of Judaizers from place to place? The truth of the gospel would have assuredly been stymied as a result of what's happening here. If you, I said this in the last sermon from Acts 13 through 15, if you're a proponent of the gospel message, the message of Jesus Christ, reaching as many people as possible so that they have the opportunity to repent and believe in Jesus, what we have just read is devastating to that work. And you can see it in the way that Paul responds in the next few verses. But we'll pause right here because in terms of application, there's a couple of things to draw out. Our main idea will help us with this this morning. So there are two ways that I believe that this section of the text intends to transform our hearts. The first is that we seek unity. We follow Paul's example in what he's doing so far in what we've read. We follow Paul's example as he defends gospel-centered unity. And more often than not, we probably do not think of gospel-centered unity and phrases like, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned in the same vein. Those two things seem separate, do they not? And yet, in this text, we see that the most loving thing that Paul can do, because there is a gospel-sized issue on the table, is defend that gospel with everything that he has. Paul realizes that the opportunity for unity exists in two different ways. One of them is vertical, and so Paul realizes that the only way for mankind to ever find unity with a holy God is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. There is no amount of works that can be added to that equation that makes a difference there. And so Paul is ready to defend a gospel because he realizes that without Christ and Christ alone, mankind has no hope for a vertical unity with God. And by extension, Paul also realizes that as mankind accepts Christ as their savior and rests in that gospel, it gives them their only hope for unity with each other, a unity that's horizontal. Paul realizes that if Jews and Gentiles can ever coexist under one banner, it is through the gospel of Christ. And folks, that's one of the reasons why I love this gospel so much. This gospel, from beginning to end, has a way of placing all of us on the same playing field, does it not? The gospel is never Jew versus Gentile. It is never black versus white. It is never male versus female. It is never any of those things. The gospel has a way of putting us all on the same playing field. We are all in a situation where we are wrecked by our sinfulness. We have been devastated by sin. We have been separated from a holy God. And all of us, no matter financial background or anything else like that, all of us are in desperate need for a savior. Paul realizes that through this true gospel of Christ, it gives mankind the only opportunity for unity with God and the only chance that they will have for unity with one another. And so he comes prepared to defend that gospel. And so that's one application point. We are seeking unity. We're seeking to follow Paul's example in this text. But in the same vein, we are also seeking to avoid hypocrisy. If we are following Paul, we are seeking to avoid the failure of Peter. And if we're honest, there's a temptation in all of our hearts to wander toward hypocrisy. Is there not? It happens every time that a person preaches a gospel of good news to the poor and yet turns a blind eye to those that are hurting and suffering in their lives. It happens every time a person affirms the transforming power of the gospel and yet sin still exists in their personal life in a way that is not being fought against or combated against, but in a way that is allowed to flourish, um, embracing immorality when we affirm a transforming power of the gospel. It happens every time a believer trusts in salvation by grace alone, and yet falls into the same trap that folks in this story do, where that one small part of your mind convinces yourself that if you work hard enough, you can earn even just a small amount of additional love or additional grace from God. 
I believe that there's a part of all of our hearts that are prone to hypocrisy. And so just in this section of verses so far, may we seek unity and may we seek to avoid hypocrisy. Paul knew that these stakes were high and he was prepared to fight for the gospel. And we see that as we get into verse 14. Look with me at these next several verses. God's word says, but when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus, even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. As you continue to pick up on Paul's tone, I can feel it escalating as I read this section of verses. What starts as a tone of confrontation develops into a tone of condemnation. Paul calls Peter out again on his, on his hypocrisy in front of everyone. Verse 16 in this section of verses is really, really important. Um, if you're someone that highlights or underlines in your Bibles, I would recommend doing so for Galatians 2:16. It's really important for this section, and it's really important for Galatians as a whole. This is one of the hinges on which the book of Galatians seems to rest. And it's because it's the first time in the text that Paul himself uses the word justified. We've talked about that a lot from this setting because Paul has been hinting and talking about that as a concept, but this is the first time that we see Paul himself talk about what it means to be justified and what justification is. Justification is to declare righteous. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Christ Jesus. And Paul is quite clear about what he believes is the source of that justification. He talks about the fact that it is um, not from the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus alone. In verse 17, Paul addresses an argument that apparently this group of Judaizers, this false group of gospel preachers was preaching. Um, he says in verse 17, but if we ourselves are also found to be sinners while seeking to be justified by Christ, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild those things that I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. And so apparently from Paul's response, we learn that there is a group of Judaizers that have been making this argument. Um, our worldview hopefully aligns with Paul and that we believe that Jesus is king, he himself is on the throne, and that he is our only source for salvation or justification. This group of Judaizers hold to a worldview that's different. It's Christ is important, but it is also works and obeying the law, and both of those things seem to be on the same playing field. And so this group of Judaizers have been saying this, if indeed Christ is king, then the law in that equation gets devalued. And if the law is in fact devalued, does that not give mankind license to sin as they please? If Christ is the only source of salvation for mankind, the law is then devalued. And then what, what purpose does it have? And they even take an extra step by saying that if indeed Christ is king and the law is devalued, then Christ himself is a promoter of sinfulness. And Paul's really clear and really concise in his response to that argument. He says, absolutely not. And he'll go on to unpack much more in the coming chapters, the relationship between faith and works. But for now, I'll summarize with this sentence. Grace leads to freedom from slavery, not a license to disobey. As we accept Christ as our savior, we are not freed to sin. We are free from the power of sin. And in verse 18, he reminds us of the purpose of the law. Um, he himself says that if these things, this work-based salvation that I have worked so hard to tear down, if these things are allowed to be built back up, if mankind is indeed seeking salvation through their works, then even I myself am a lawbreaker, and by extension, so is everyone else. The, the law was never intended to be a measurement by which mankind is saved. The, law is, um, uh, the law's purpose is to expose in our hearts and, and show us just how depraved and sinful and hopeless we are and in the same way point us toward a savior in Christ. In the last few verses we have this morning, I'm starting with verse 19, we'll finish out this section. For though I died to, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What does Paul mean when he says that he has died to the law? The result of Paul's death to the law is that he is no longer under its jurisdiction. Whereas before Christ, Paul was, Paul and all of mankind was in a situation where he would never overcome the power of sin. Because of the power of Christ, he now has. The law is now powerless over him. Paul goes on to say that he has been crucified with Christ. He makes a similar statement in Romans 6.3 when he says, are you aware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into death? What does that mean, crucified with Christ? Um, There's a book by David Platt and Tony Merida, a Christ-centered exposition of Galatians, in which they answered this question this way. They say this, we die to sin, its power, its penalty, and its dominion. All of our sin, past, present, and future, have been paid for on the cross. Christ has taken all of it. And it's at that point in the story that honestly, we could enter into a time of invitation. Um, that, that portion of the story, that truth is such that it would lend really well to us praying and being encouraged in that vein. But Paul has one more verse and we have one more concept that we need to address. I hope that you've heard it said before that no sermon's complete unless it points really clearly to Jesus. And Paul gives us a really easy lane to do that as we close out in verse 21. Paul writes this, and he closes chapter two by writing this. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Paul drops an appropriate hammer as he closes out this section of his text, as if there's any question about where Paul stands in this tension between a works-based and a Christ-based salvation. Paul is quite clear. He is clinging desperately to the grace of God. And he reminds his audience that if works are indeed able to cover the sins of mankind, if there is a scenario where I can work hard enough to earn my salvation, then what value does the cross really have? What value does the cross and empty grave really hold? If I can work for my salvation, I have no need for a savior. And as such, it means that Christ died for nothing. But we know this morning that that is not the case. We know that there was a reason for Christ's death and resurrection. We know that Christ's death in our place to pay the penalty for our sins changes absolutely everything. It gives us our only opportunity to find unity as mankind with a holy God, and it gives us our only opportunity to find unity with each other. And so this morning as we close out, I would implore you to do one of two things. If you have never made the decision to repent and trust in Jesus as your savior, I would encourage you to consider that decision this morning. I would love nothing more and our staff would love nothing more than to have a conversation with you this week about what that looks like, faith in Jesus, trusting in Jesus. And so if that's something that you would like to discuss, please know that the door is always open for that. Contact information is in your worship guides. And if you are a believer in Jesus, if you have made the decision to trust in Jesus as your savior, May we fix our eyes on Christ alone this morning. May we seek unity. May we seek to avoid hypocrisy. And may we trust fully in Christ alone for justification. Church, would you pray with me? Father, I pray that as we are going through this different style, this different genre of of scripture, Father, that the message that Paul is writing would not um, become so familiar to us that the power of it is taken away, Father. God, may we be a church, may we be a body that in this community and in communities all over the world champion the idea of salvation in Christ alone. God, may every one of our eggs be in that basket, God, and may you help us by your spirit to avoid any temptation to place our faith and trust in anything other than Jesus. Father, I pray for for those of us who may be in the room that have never made that decision before, that you would be gracious to us and work in our hearts as you lead us and draw us closer to you. And Father, I pray for our church, as most of us are believers, Father, that you would give us the strength to follow Paul's example and seek gospel-centered unity in all things, Um, in some ways standing up for issues that we cannot set aside for, gospel-sized, gospel-centered issues. And God, in the same vein, always seeking unity and being slow to take offense and caring and loving one another well. God, may we avoid the pitfall of hypocrisy, the struggle that Peter had in this text. Father, may that not be our story. God, may we be a church, may we be a body, may we be families and believers and individuals who are known for trusting fully in Christ alone. God, we love you, and it's in your name we pray.
Amen.